high voltage electricity could create some super awesome plasma arcs. I think that everyone saw those plasma arc lighters that you could buy from eBay for like 10 euros. Those are pretty interesting and it should be an awesome project to make. The plasma arc is made as high voltage discharge through air. So let's take a look on how those things work. What's up my friends, welcome back! First of all, be careful. This project is quite dangerous because we will use high voltages. Even if the output power is low, this voltage could injure you so please be careful. So I have already bought my electric R lighter from eBay. But till the package arrives I thought it should be nice to try to make one myself. Or at least learn how it works if I can manage to make it work. So what is inside of an arc lighter? Well since it works with electrical power there should be a battery to store the energy. To build mine I'll use a small LiPo battery like this one. But what should be the voltage of our battery? Let's first understand how the lighter works and later talk about the input voltage. In order to create a plasma arc we need a high voltage. Very very high voltage. I bet that you heard about the term of dielectric strength. If not I'll explain it to you. A dielectric is an isolating material. And the dielectric strength is the maximum electrical field that a pure material can withstand under ideal condition without breaking down and experiencing failure on its isolating properties. So for example, do you think wood is a dielectric? Does wood isolate voltage? Or plastic? Since all I know every wire or electrical tool is isolated in plastic of some sort. But is plastic really an isolating material? Well, it depends. It depends of the applied voltage. Of course that for a voltage of 220 volts or 150 it's a good isolator. But for a voltage at for example 10,000 volts just a thin layer of plastic won't isolate the wire. So each material has its isolating properties and the dielectric strength is measured in megavolts per meter. So for example polyester material needs 19.7 megavolts per meter to break down. By breakdown I mean to create a discharge between two points of the isolated material. So that means that we can isolate 19.7 thousand volts with just one millimeter layer of polyester. So basically in theory any material can transport electricity, it all depends of the applied voltage. What we are interested in today is the dielectric strain of air since the plasma arc will flow through air. If we check this table we can see that the dielectric strain of air is approximately 3 megavolts per meter. This is why those electrical power wires from the power central are separated more than 3 meters between each other. Those wires can carry voltages higher than 2 million volts. So 3 megavolts per meter it's 3000 volts per millimeter. So in the best condition we should have a 3000 volts differential voltage between two electrodes separated 1 millimeter one to each other in order to create a discharge. If we want our arc to have 3 or 4 millimeters we should have about 10,000 volts. So how can we obtain this 10,000 volts? Well obviously a transformer. No, no, not the Marvel transformers but an electricity transformer. A typical transformer is made out of two wire windings around a core usually made of ferrite or metal. When you apply AC voltage on one coil, this coil will create a magnetic field. The magnetic field passes through the core and gets to the second coil. As we know from Faraday laws, a magnetic flux change inducts a current in the coil. So the same variation of magnetic field that the first coil creates will induce a current in the secondary coil. This current will be equal to a voltage drop. So in order to create a magnetic flux variation we need an oscillating AC voltage. It doesn't have to be a sine wave, it could be also a square wave. In a normal transformer the voltage ratio is related with the number of windings of the first and second coil. 
in an ideal transformer, the output to the input voltage ratio is equal to the secondary coil number of windings divided by the primary coil number of windings, like shown here. So, for example, if we have our primary coil with just 10 windings and the secondary with 100 windings, and we apply 10 volts of AC voltage at the input, we will have 10 volts multiplied by the ratio between 100 and 10, which is 10. So, we will have a total of 100 volts at the output. On the other hand, the output to input current ratio is proportional to the input winding number of turns to the output, which is backwards to the voltage ratio. As you know, power is voltage times current. And if you combine those together, you will realize that in an ideal transformer, 100% efficient, the input power is equal to the output power. Of course, in real life, there are many losses that will reduce the efficiency, such as core losses in form of heat, wire resistance losses and so on. So, if we want our 10,000 volts, we should have a transformer with more than 10,000 winding ratio, which is crazy. We should use a transformer with 10 windings for the primary coil and 100,000 windings for the second coil. Obviously, we won't do that. The solution to our problem is a flyback converter with a flyback transformer. In order to increase our voltage, we will take use of the inductor properties. Unlike a capacitor that tries as hard as it can to keep the voltage across it as stable as possible by sourcing and sinking surges of current, the inductor tries to keep its current stable as much as it can by searching the voltage across it. So if you charge it to a certain current, it tries to not allow or slowly change that current. What does that do for us? Let's take a look at this circuit. At the beginning, the current through the inductor L1 is zero. When we close the switch, the inductor slowly allows the current to rise through. Say it rises to 1 ampere, and then we open the switch. But the inductor wants to continue driving 1 ampere of current. So what will happen is that it will have to push the current through the D1 diode, which was off up to this point, and will turn it on and now the current would run through the R1 resistor. Now let's say that R1 is 1 kilo ohm. So 1 ampere of current multiplied by 1 kilo ohm is 1000 volts. That should be the generated voltage across the resistor in form of a spike that dissipates quickly. So just that easily we created a 1 kilo volt spike. This means that the voltage across the inductor on the diode side jumped close to 1000 volts, or in order to continue outputting 1 ampere. In this tutorial, we should be aware that if we generate huge voltages, all our components such as the inductor, switch, diode and resistor should be able to handle and not to break under such voltages. The thing is that we won't use an inductor. But we had to take this small lesson about inductors in order to understand how a flyback converter works. A flyback transformer, also called a line output transformer, is a special type of electrical transformer. It was initially designed to generate high voltage sawtooth signals at a relatively high frequency. It is equivalent to that of a buck boost converter, with the inductor split in two to form a transformer. So this flyback transformer is like a normal one, but the first coil is split in two. Unlike a normal transformer which operates at 50 or 60 Hz, a flyback transformer is designed to operate at high frequency, so we cannot simply connect the primary coil of the flyback to a normal power supply. Instead, we need a circuit to generate a high frequency input to the primary coil. This is the circuit that we are going to use, and it is very beautiful on its simplicity. It cannot be run at very high power, and the transistor tends to get quite hot, and needs to be heat synced properly. Still, it is a very simple circuit for making high voltages, and can be used to draw electrical arcs. When the switching transistor is turned on in a flyback converter, the primary winding of the transformer is energized as we talked about earlier in the inductor properties, and no energy is transferred to the secondary windings. When the transistor is turned off, 
the field collapses and all the energy is transferred to the secondary windings. This differs from a forward converter topology, where energy is transferred to the secondary windings when the switching transistor is turned on. You can easily tell the difference between these two topologies. So, how this circuit works? When power is applied to the positive and negative terminals, current begins to flow to the feedback coil to the base of the transistor. This turns on the transistor and current flows through the primary coil. As this happens, a voltage is induced in the secondary coil, creating our high voltage spark because of the stored energy in the coil before of the transistor switch. At the same time, another smaller voltage is also induced in the feedback winding, opposite in polarity of the base voltage, causing the transistor to turn off. As the magnetic field collapses, again high voltage is induced in the secondary. Now there is no more feedback current in the feedback coil, and once again current flows through the primary because the transistor is switched on once again, and the cycle repeats on its own natural frequency over and over again. Because of this, this circuit is self-oscillating and settles at its optimal frequency depending of the load. So this should create our high frequency high voltage. This kind of voltage should create our plasma arc. For that, we need a flyback high voltage transformer. We have two options. It all depends on the material that we have. We could find a high voltage transformer usually inside of any LCD screen. I have this old broken LCD monitor laying around on my workshop. I will take the high voltage transformer out. If you don't have an LCD monitor, we will see how to build our high voltage transformer later. But first, let's open the LCD. It is quite easy to identify the transformer. The LCD screen has some cold neon tubes that light up the entire screen. Those neon tubes work with high voltages. So identify the circuit with high voltage labels and wires that go to the top and bottom of the screen. There is where usually the neon tubes are. Here it is. To take it out, first fill the pads with solder. Now I hit the two pins at the same time and take it apart. I do the same for the other side. So this is the high voltage transformer. We can see that the secondary coil is separated in a few layers. That is to prevent arcs discharge inside of the transformer. We don't want that. At the bottom we have our primary and flyback coils. This transformer usually gives us a few hundred volts. If we were to use it in our project, we should unwind the primary coil and wind a new one with less windings. Around 4 or 5 windings for the primary coil. The secondary should stay the same. Another option, if you don't have the LCD screen, is to build our high voltage transformer. I've used this small transformer that I took out from an old computer power supply. You could find these small transformers in all kinds of power supplies, mobile transformers, laptop chargers and so on. All we need is to make sure that the ferrite core is not broken, because that's the part that we need. I desolder the transformer from the PCB. Unwrap the transformer and carefully take out the ferrite block. Be very gentle, this thin ferrite can crack very easy and is the most important thing that we need from this transformer. Now unwind the transformer 0.2mm copper wire and store it for later. We have to make our own coils. First we will wind the secondary coil. For that we will need a lot of thin coil copper wire. You can find this kind of wire in any quartz old Chinese clocks. We will make the secondary coil with 0.1mm copper wire. We have to make about 1000 windings for the secondary coil. But be careful, since inside of the coil there will be high voltages and the layers are very close one to each other, there could be plasma arcs inside of the transformer and we don't want that. In order to prevent that to happen, we should put 10 layers of scotch tape every 200 layers or so, to give a little bit of space between every differential voltages. Take something with round shape and the diameter bigger than the inside part of the ferrite core. 
measure the core dimension and start wrapping some tape to give the limits of the coil. I've used this screwdriver. Now wrap some tape with the sticky side on the exterior, like so. Now we can start winding the secondary coil. Take the 0.1mm wire and tape it on the side of the tool. Now start winding. Make sure that every 200 or 300 layer you put some scotch tape layers. After that I keep winding. I finished my coil. Now I'll put some white glue on it to be sure that the coil won't move. I'll let it dry. Our secondary coil is ready. Put another layer of tape to separate the secondary coil from the first one. Now for the first and flyback coils we will use 0.2 and 0.4 mm copper wire. Wrap together two wires at one end. First, wind the primary coil in one direction. It will only have five windings. Now wind the flyback coil in the opposite direction. It should have about 10 to 12 windings. Now what we should do is to solder some thicker wires to the secondary coil output. I will use these two green wires. Place the output in such a way that one wire will be on one side and the other on the other side of the coil. Now secure the wires and give a final two or three layers of tape. The coil is ready. Take it out carefully and join the core with the coil in the middle. Now using some tape once again, secure the ferret core in place very tight. Use super glue if necessary. I will give another layer of tape to make sure that it's very tight and isolated. Our flyback transformer is ready. Now we have to mount this next circuit. We will use one 50 or 100 ohm resistor and one diode. The transistor could be an N50 high voltage NPN transistor or an IRF Zeta 44 MOSFET. If you use the MOSFET just remove the diode from the circuit. That's it. We make all the connections. Remember to add a heat dissipator to the transistor otherwise it will burn out. Solder the resistor and diode together, respecting the direction of the diode. Solder the transistor and make the connection between the transformer and the transistor. I will solder some wires and some male pins to the output and connect this to a power supply. The applied voltage should be between 3.7 and 7.4 volts. The plasma arc will be discharged to the closest point of the output. So for that close a little bit together the pins. Let's turn it on. As you can see there is our plasma arc. It is so nice and the sound it makes is awesome. As you can see it's quite powerful. The plasma can even burn wood. It would be great to make a plasma cutter with this and use it to engrave wood. Let's now test the other transformer that we took out from the LCD screen. Let's test it first without any changes to the primary coil. If you want to increase the power of it you should reduce the amount of windings on the primary coil. For that carefully unwind the primary and flyback coils and make the same windings as in the previous transformer. I solder all the components of the circuit. This time I will use the IRF Zeta 44 MOSFET transistor and I will remove the diode. The rest of the circuit is the same. Solder everything in place. The common wire which is the middle one is positive. Supply around 5 volts to the input and test it out. As you can see there is our plasma arc. This circuit draws a lot of current so you should use a powerful power supply or maybe directly a LiPo battery. If the circuit is not working it could be because of the low current. So this transformer and this circuit works as well. If you don't want to build this circuit and you only want the high voltage module, you could also buy it for very cheap, but that is not as interesting as building it. I bought this high voltage module from eBay. 
The specification of this module tells me that it has 400 kV output, but I doubt that. Anyway, this makes a very high voltage that creates a powerful arc. The sound that this one makes is incredible. Be careful, this project is quite dangerous. Always take all the protection measures while working. If you are not sure of something, it's better not to connect the power supply. This kind of voltages can injure you, so be very careful. Also, the plasma arc can create some radiation, so might damage your eyes if you look at it long enough. Please, be careful. So, this was my high voltage arc lighter project. All I need now is to make a case with a push button to turn it on and off. I'll design the case in Blender and 3D print it. I think it's better to give the case a shape of a taser. This is not a taser, the circuit is completely different. This is the 3D printed case. I think I made it a little bit too small. Place all the components inside along with the LiPo battery. I first glue in place the push button and solder some wires from the button to the LiPo battery. I've glued in place the LiPo battery using double side band. Solder all the wires and take out the output to the exterior of the case. Screw close the case and we are ready to test it. This is my final arc lighter. Pretty cool, right? It is very powerful. It can ignite paper in just one second. Don't touch the plasma arc. It will injure you and the pain is very strong. I hope that you enjoyed this project. If so, like and share it with your friends in order to motivate me for more videos like this one. Also, subscribe to my channel. If you have any questions, just leave it in the comment section below or on my Q&A page. All the links are in the description below as always. Thanks again and see you later guys.